Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending today's CPEC Brown Bag. We have a special guest today, John Crockett. Uh, just um, to give you a brief introduction about his work, interest, and experience. John is a writer, educator, musician, and soundscape recordist who is inspired by the voices of the earth. He is a member of the musical duo Coraco, which brands Celtic Harp, Cero, Irish Whistles, and Natural Soundscape recordings to create programs of Celtic and original music inspired by the land and the sea and their creatures. John has worked with the Ware Conservation Institute, Ocean Alliance, Blue Ocean Society for Marine Conservation, and Massachusetts Audubon Society. John is currently the Lab and Herbarium Coordinator at Antioch University, New England, in the Department of Environmental Studies. John lives in Westminster, uh, Vermont, and records soundscapes in Vermont and the Bay of Fundy, New Brunswick. Again, thank you very much, John, for accepting our invitation. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erasmus. Thank you for, for inviting me to talk today. Um, and please let me know if I'm not talking loud enough. I, I tried having a little lapel mic thing, and that didn't work. But I know my, my vo voice is a little soft these days. So if you have any trouble hearing, just wave your arms around or something. Um, so that recording that we were just listening to, um, whenever I do a presentation, I like to have a recording that represents uh, this particular day and in, in the singing life of Earth. So uh, that recording I, I made just before uh, leaving home this morning. Um, and sort of the most prominent sound in there was the hairy woodpecker drumming, um, which is a mating uh, activity. And it's the first I've heard them this spring. So spring is coming. Um, this subject of, of soundscape studies is so huge that uh, it's really difficult to figure out how to approach it uh, in any sort of small, uh, short, short span of time. So um, I have decided today to focus on two things. One is to just give a general introduction to soundscape ecology and soundscape studies, and hopefully spark some interest in bringing more uh, soundscape studies into all of our environmental studies. And then uh, the special focus today is going to be on why I think that listening um, as opposed to, to recording, an actual listening, uh, I think is a particularly potent way of experiencing uh, and understanding the natural world and our relationship with it. Um, for me, listening is a particularly uh, intimate act. And really that's what listening is about for me is simultaneously being present to and being in the presence of a particular place, both knowing it and being known by it. And although we maybe don't always credit the natural world with being capable of knowing us, and the way that it knows us may not be the way we know things, um, but it's very clear that it knows us, and how we present ourselves to it has a lot to do with how it responds to us. Uh, certainly, as a, as a natural soundscape recordist, I know very well that if I go into an area to record, um, I have to be very still uh, for at least an hour for the activity that was frightened by my arrival to return to something more like normal. Uh, and I've had recorders out over long periods of time, uh, and there are some animals who won't return 
to a spot for more than 24 hours, I think because of scent that's left. So when we enter in a place, obviously we affect it. And uh, every, everybody's paying attention to us, uh, mostly to try to figure out whether we're a threat. Um, but I, for me, listening, being out in the natural world, and, and listening and being still, uh, makes it very clear that the world is listening to me as well. So I'd like to start um, with just a little bit of how I got into this. And this is the part where I get to play some of my favorite recordings. My first uh, experience of a soundscape recording was when I was 10 years old. And my father, uh, for a completely different reason, bought a Sony reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. It was like this big. <laughs> um, and one night, just for the fun of it, he turned it on to record the sound of tree frogs and peepers outside uh, our house in Gunnarsson, Vermont. And I have never forgotten, I mean, even though we, we heard them, you know, every night uh, in the summer, I've never forgotten those recordings. There was something about the fact that he, he made that recording that really caught my attention and made me pay more attention to what was going on in the soundscape. Um, then when I got to college, uh, I, my degree, my bachelor's degree is in linguistics, and uh, my senior year I took a course in animal communication, and at the same time I was taking a course in child language acquisition, and I was really struck by the commonality of how songbirds learn to vocalize and how human infants learn to speak. And the, the similarities are so striking that um, it, for me, it was, it was sort of the beginning of breaking down the barrier that at least I had been taught between the human and other animals, uh, to see how uh, songbirds and humans both go through a very, very similar process for learning how to vocalize. Uh, spoke to me very profoundly of our commonality and our common origins with the other animals. Um, after that, I really wanted to work with uh, animal vocalization in some way, and it took quite a few years, uh, but eventually I had the opportunity to work with Roger Payne, uh, who back in 1967, uh, along with his wife Katie, discovered that humpback whales sing, and also discovered, uh, really Katie made the discovery that um, humpback whales uh, change their songs fairly rapidly over the course of the season. Um, and so the, the song, that they all sing the same song, but they're const they're, it's constantly evolving over the course of the season. And so the song that humpback whales are singing now is very different from the song they were singing back in the 60s. This is what they sounded like back in the 60s. No? It's, it's sort of amazing to think that for, for many years the Navy was picking up these recordings and they just had absolutely no idea what it was that was making this sound. And a and, uh, man named the by the name of Frank Watlington, who worked with all of the, the hydrophones that the Navy had put out in order to detect um, Soviet submarines, sort of suspected that, that it was whales who were making this sound, but they didn't have any confirmation. So then it was Roger in, in the 90s, late 1960s who made the confirmation uh, that these were humpback whales. Um, so I worked with Roger for several years and learned most of what I know about marine acoustics and marine mammal communication from him. And then uh, in the 2000s, early 2000s, I was in the Bay of Fundy, uh, New Brunswick, and I was drawn there because it was a, at that time a 
hot spot for marine mammals and particularly for whales, for right whales, uh, humpback whales, uh, fin whales, minke whales, harbor porpoises, um, and then also a lot of large colonies of uh, harbor seals and gray seals. And uh, a lot of pelagic birds as well. And it's, so it's a really rich uh, marine environment. It's also a really rich sonic environment. And I absolutely fell in love with the sonic environment of the Bay of Fundy, which this is behaving itself. <laughs> Now this is the Bay of Fundy in the middle of the night. Uh, you'll, it's pitch black, you can't see anything. It actually took me several years uh, before I was able to identify what's, what's making this sound. I asked dozens and dozens of people who live there, uh, and I got dozens of different answers as to what was making the sound. But it was totally pitch black, you can't see anything. You have to just get it by the pulse. And I, so then I asked uh, any number of friends and acquaintances who were birders, and, and I still didn't get a clear answer. Um, I finally found somebody at the Audubon Center at Joppa Flats on Palm Island uh, who recognized that this is the greater shear water. And, and the greater shear water. So, um, <laughs> because they only vocalize at night, it wasn't easy to identify them. And uh, all the literature I could find said that the shearwaters don't vocalize. <laughs> I guess if you can't see it, you can't uh, <laughs> prove it. So, since then I found a few places that do actually have shearwater vocalization. So it is definitely is a great shearwater. So what is it about sound? I, as I was... I would just spend hours in the Bay of Fundy listening to the whales blowing uh, as they surface to feed, uh, to the herring running along the surface of the water, to the sheer waters, uh, to the seals breathing. And I felt there's that kind of intimacy with, with the bay that I, that I didn't normally experience. So what is it about sound uh, that, that creates that intimacy, and that's, that's mostly what I want to talk about today. So first of all, I think it helps to understand what sound is. So sound is a pressure wave that is created by a sender or a source propagating through a medium within the perceptual range of a receiver. Now there are a lot of environmental factors that affect the sender, the receiver, and the medium. And then, of course, there are genetic and cultural factors that affect uh, the coding and the decoding that goes on at the sender end and at the receiver end that actually creates these signals and, and makes them intelligible. But the thing that I think makes sound uh, very different from sight which is our dominant sense, is that middle factor, the medium that the sound requires. So you probably all know that light does not require a medium. Light travels through the vacuum of space. There's no sound in a vacuum. Sound requires a medium. And the quality of the sound is dependent on the quality of the medium. So for instance, sound in water has very different properties than sound in air. So the sound that you're hearing is not just the, what the sound that the sender is producing, but it's also the way in which that sound has been modified by the medium that it's traveling through. So in a sense, you're hearing the medium as well as hearing the sender. Um, so this could be uh, important. Uh, part of what's happening in the relationship between senders and receivers because those changes in the environment will cause changes in the transmission of the signal. And uh, the sender, in order to get 
a signal through needs to be able to adapt to those changes uh, because it will change how well it, its signal is able to be transmitted. So there's a lot of, there, there does seem to be a lot of adaptability in our, most animals who vocalize in how they encode their signal uh, so that it can be heard adequately uh, in changing environmental circumstances. Um, the, the most, uh, one of the most glaring examples of that is with the right whale. Um, the shipping noise uh, in the water has been increasing significantly. And um, in order to get a clear channel for their communication, when a ship arrives in the area, the right whales will change the frequency at which they vocalize in order to find uh, a place that's a little less noisy. Um, and a, a lot of different animals uh, do that, and, and we'll see another example of that in a little bit. The other thing um, about the sound is that the medium, so in, in you know, birds and all terrestrial animals are vocalizing in air, um, that air, of course, is, is in kind of an envelope. It's contained in a landscape. And every particular place has its own sonic qualities. So actually, uh, there's there's a pretty a lot of complexity in what's going on. Uh, the receiver of that signal is not only hearing what the sender is is creating, but also hearing the medium through which the sound is traveling, and hearing everything in the landscape off which those sounds are reflected. And so sender and receiver have to be able to cope with uh, all of those, cha any changes that might be occurring in all of those aspects of the landscape. And uh, if those senders and receivers are not able to adapt to those changes, then of course they are probably going to drop out of that particular place because they're so their vocalizations are critical to their survival. So uh, sound has, uh, the sounds that we hear are t giving us a lot of information about the world that we are living in and moving through. Uh, most of that is subconscious. But, um, you know, there's a really big difference between the sound quality of this room versus the sound quality of being in the forest, you know, versus the sound quality of being on a mountaintop or in a desert. You know, every place has its has, is like its own theater. You know, theaters are designed to have a particular sound quality. Every place is its own theater. Um, just as sort of an aside, you know, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the um, the singing tradition in Tuva, which is a country in Central Asia, north of Mongolia. Uh, they have a long history of uh, mimetic singing, so they're, they're imitating uh, sounds, animals, and streams, and, and places. And they have songs that are composed in very particular places because of the acoustics of that place. And the song isn't supposed to be performed anywhere else because it doesn't sound the same anywhere else. So I think that we're, we're mostly not aware um, well, we're, we're subconsciously aware, but we're not consciously aware of the huge amount of information that we are receiving constantly about the world around us through sound. And I think it's because of the way that sound interacts with the environment and is affected by every change in the envi environment. That's part of why uh, listening is such an intimate experience. I think there are some other things going on, too. Let me just talk a little bit about human hearing in particular. Um, because we are set up to listen to the natural world. So the human voice, where I'm speaking, uh, so human uh, sound uh, can be categorized in a number of ways, uh, but one of the most essential elements is the frequency, so you know, which another word for which is pitch. Um, the word frequency can be a little confusing because you can also talk about frequency as a time interval, but uh, in, in acoustics, frequency is, is pitch. So I'm speaking currently to, well, we can, we can hear in a range from about 
about 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. Hertz is simply the measurement of the number of beats per second. So the sound is a pressure wave that's propagating through the air. And um, at 20 beats per second, it's a very, very low frequency. At 20,000 beats per second, it's a very high frequency, really at the up, very upper limit of what we can hear. Uh, most animals communicate within our our range of hearing. Um, elephants uh, and whales communicate at uh, subsonic levels below what we can hear, and of course bats uh, communicate at, at uh, ultrasonic levels that we can't hear. Um, some insects are at the very, very upper range or beyond of what we can hear. So the human voice, what I'm speaking right now is probably about 500 hertz. Um, the range of the human voice is from about um, 100 hertz to about 1,000 hertz. Um, so there's 100 down there, and there's 1,000. So you can see, I think this is a recording of my voice. So I'm, I'm at around 700 hertz. So the interesting thing about human hearing uh, although we can hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz, our hearing sensitivity is not even across that range. And one would sort of think that if we're speaking at around 700 to 1,000 hertz, that our hearing would be most sensitive to each other's voices, but that is not the case. Human hearing sensitivity, and this is, uh, so you can kind of keep that in mind. This is very similar. So human, this is just a different ways of representing the sensitivity of human hearing. So human hearing is most sensitive up around three or 4,000 hertz. In other words, we can hear sounds up around here that are much, much quieter than sounds down here at the low end and at the very high end of our hearing range. So the question then is why? Why would we have evolved to be able to hear things really, really well at around three or 4,000 hertz? What is it in our world that is making sounds at three or 4,000 hertz? So there's our hearing sensitivity, and there's the zone for us. We are biologically tuned to listen to birds. It's in our DNA. Is it because eggs are a nice source of protein? <laughs> Easy to steal? Well, that's possible. Wake up call. Another possibility is yeah. that where there are birds, there's food and water. And if you're looking for food and water and you follow the birds, you're going to find food and water. But I think that. Uh, the main reason is because birds are the great messengers of the world. They vocalize, they communicate through their vocalization everything that's going on around them. They are so tuned in, especially, of course, to the arrival of potential predators. But depending on whether they are quiet, whether they are making soft you know, contact noises, whether they're singing, whether they're making warning calls, you can get a huge amount of information about what's going on in the world around you well out of range of sight. I have heard stories, I've never experienced, I don't have this level of, of intimacy with birdsong to be able to do this, but I've heard stories from trackers who have worked 
uh, with the people in the Kalahari Desert, that they are so tuned into the birds that they can tell not only when a particular species of predator has entered the area, they can tell when a particular individual has entered the area. Because the birds can tell when a particular individual has entered, and the way that they talk to each other uh, communicates the arrival or departure of that particular individual. So if you're tuned into the birds, you've got a lot of information about what's going on well out of sight. Um, so I think because of that, the, the birds can be kind of a, bird listening can be kind of a, it's kind of a gateway species, or uh, uh, listening to the whole soundscape, listening to the whole environment. I think a lot of people probably start paying attention to the soundscape by listening to birds. And of course, a lot of bird listening uh, is done by bird watchers who are mainly interested in being able to identify uh, the species. And you know, we hear a lot of birds that we never see, so that's a really useful skill to be able to identify species by their song. Um, but what I'm more interested in is this tuning into the whole soundscape, not just to individual species and learning to identify them, but really being able to open up our awareness so that we're aware of what's happening in the whole chorus of everything that's vocalizing. And this uh, relatively new approach to uh, natural, natural uh, soundscapes uh, goes under the name of soundscape ecology, at least in this country, in Europe, it's sometimes called ecoacoustics. Um, soundscape ecology was, uh, one of the founders of it was Bernie Krauss, who is a musician uh, and has one of the world's premier soundscape recordists. Uh, he's been recording uh, natural soundscapes all over the world uh, since the 1960s. And um, he noticed that the dominant approach to sound in, uh, in environmental studies uh, which goes under the name of bioacoustics, is looking at individual organisms uh, and how they vocalize and how their vocalizations are received by their intended recipients, but in isolation from everything else that's going on in the soundscape. And he felt after many decades of listening and recording that there was uh, structure and complexity within the soundscape as a whole that is uh, comparable to the complexity that is happening in ecosystems as a whole, uh, not just at the you know, interactions of the <laughs> organismic level. So uh, he started Soundscape Ecology at least to get people asking that question, are soundscapes complex ecological systems? Or maybe they're just you know, a bunch of you know, disconnected organisms doing their organismic thing, um, and there's nothing really going on to be gained from looking at the whole. But, uh, but that was his, his essential question in the founding of Soundscape Ecology. What's, are they complex systems um, comparable to complex ecological systems? Um, soundscape Ecology is, is only a little more than about a decade old, so um, there's a lot of room for innovation, a lot more questions than answers. Uh, a lot that, that still needs to be discovered, and a lot that was originally uh, posited that isn't really playing out very well, uh, and, or at least as well as was originally hoped. Um, the main thing that soundscape ecology at this point has, uh, has shown pretty <laughs> conclusively is that most soundscapes are, are structured. So what can often sound to us like cacophony uh, actually has a lot of structure to it. So this is both a recording and a spectrogram of fall insects. Um, so a spectrogram is simply a representation of the sound, and this is the representation of the sound that you're hearing right now with time on the x-axis uh, we have here from three minutes to eight minutes for the, for the whole thing and then uh, on the 
y-axis is the frequency. So this is going from a low of zero up to a high of 10,000 hertz. So just listen to this for a second. It's a little hard for us with our hearing to, to tease out the different layers, but there are at least five layers in this recording, okay? So uh, at the bottom, we have some fairly distant tree crickets, and they're distant enough that you can't see the individual crickets vocalizing. It's sort of smeared uh, because there are a lot of them, and, and they're somewhat distant. At the next layer up, so that was down at just over 2,000 hertz. At the next layer up at about 1,200, we have this, which is actually a spring peeper in the fall. They do vocalize some in the fall. You don't get the, the really loud choruses that you get in the spring. Um, so that's a spring peeper. And then at the next layer, we have a fall field cricket. So you can see each vocalization is a little triple trill about once a second, so a little triple trill every second. And then uh, the next layer up, we have a couple of ground crickets. So you can see these different organisms are segregating into different frequency bands. Um, the probable reason for this is that uh, every organism needs to be heard, or there's no point in vocalizing. And if they were all competing with each other in the same frequency bands, uh, they would all have to compete with volume. And uh, singing louder takes energy. Uh, it requires more respiration. It requires more metabolism, a higher metabolism. So there's an energetic cost if you're having to complete, compete sonically with everything else by singing louder. And there's a lot of that that does go on. There are a lot of organisms, in order to get over to the background level, they just sing louder. And there are a lot of you know, insects and frogs. It's a lot of evidence that you know, females are more attracted to the louder singer, male singers. And so getting louder is, is pretty common. But if you can find a frequency band or a temporal band, if you can fit yourself in between other, other organisms' vocalizations, <coughs> you don't have to expend as much energy in order to get your signal across. So there's a, an interesting thing going on here with the ground crickets. Um, you can see here that there's one that started, and then a second one started, and it's, you can't tell either by li from listening to it or by looking at the spectrogram, um, but they separate, which one did it, but they separate out. So they both started here at around, um, 54, 5,500 kilohertz, and then one of them gradually or fairly quickly rose up to around 6 kilohertz. So, and then they continued on singing in, in slightly different frequency bands. I can't tell whether it was the original one, who, the second one came in and he went, uh-oh, you know, I've got competition, I'm going to raise my frequency a bit in order to get away from the competitor or whether the competitor came in and said, oh, this, this isn't going to work coming in the same, so I'm going to raise mine. I can't tell which one did it. But they then continue on uh, in those different frequencies, uh, and the volume is pretty much the same, and they don't have to compete e with each other in, in volume, and it doesn't cost them anything energetically to move to a different frequency band. So the hypothesis of soundscape ecology at the beginning was that this is what all uh, intact ecosystems should look like. All of the organisms who are vocalizing within that system uh, should be segregated into separate frequency bands. They've had plenty of time, and they haven't had significant disruptions to the system. So they should have uh, segregated into uh, what was called um, sonic niches. And this was called the... the um, Sorry. This was called the acoustic niche hypothesis. Uh, and so it was thought that this could then be used as a guide to whether a system was intact or whether it had been disturbed. 
because the hypothesis was that in a disturbed system, you would have had new organisms that would have moved in, um, or you would have had uh, organisms that would have dropped out. And in, in the sound field, you would have a lot more competition, and you'd have a lot more gaps. Now, an acoustic niche isn't the same thing as an ecological niche in the sense that um, acoustic niches are really just spaces. They're not functions. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any indication that, like, if you lose, uh, if you were to lose the ground crickets from this acoustic space, that that would have any kind of cascading influence throughout the sound system. So it's a little bit uh, misleading for them for it to have been called the acoustic niche hypothesis, because they're not really like ecological niches. Um, and in fact, the whole acoustic niche hypothesis isn't really holding up very well. Um, partly, it's, it's hard to study because there are so few truly intact ecosystems left on the planet. Uh, and Bernie Krause has recordings from 50 years ago um, that he says, you know, bolster his hypothesis um, because, you know, if you go back, there, there are, he says half of his recordings you can't, you couldn't even get anymore because those systems, are, they're just gone. Or they're so disrupted now that they, they don't bear any resemblance to what they were 50 years ago. So um, that's not really, that hasn't really been validated, um, and it's hard to validate it, but it also just seems to be that Indeed, organisms are perfectly willing to expend energy in order to sing louder or call louder um, if that's what they have to do. And, um, and that seems to be going on in quite a few intact systems as well as disturbed, disturbed systems. Um, so, so soundscape ecology um, as, a, as a study I think my, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not deeply involved with it, um, but my sense from the reading that I'm doing is that it's struggling a little bit for to find legitimacy, uh, because some of the er the other thing that they've tried a lot to do is to create, um, to create indices of biodiversity using soundscape recordings. Uh, the idea being that you can you can put a recorder out, you can record the entire soundscape, and then you can analyze that for presence or absence of species, for uh, for diversity of species, for density, you know, for those things, and then you could use these soundscape recordings as an indication of the biodiversity of a place. That has turned out to be really uh, problematic. And the indices that they've come up with have not turned out to be very robust. So uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But um, it means the soundscape ecology, I feel like it had a lot of promise at the start. And it's struggling a little bit to find its place within the larger world of environmental studies and um, conservation biology. Uh, as, as it's turning out that these recordings, although they yield a lot of information, um, there, are some, there are some very specific issues, which I'll get to in a second. But the one area that I think soundscape ecology is making a very significant contribution is in the study of the impact of anthropogenic noise on natural systems. And because our shipping and air traffic is so ubiquitous, there really isn't anywhere in the world you can go and get away from it. Every system everywhere is impacted by that noise. And the ways in which natural systems are being impacted by noise still requires a lot of study. Um, I have some recordings that I, uh, unfortunately, in order to really hear it, you have to listen for about half an hour, so we can't do it. But I have some re cricket recordings, um, and you know, crickets uh, sometimes synchronize their vocalizations. They get into the same beat with each other, and there are some amphibians that do this too. And they will um, they'll synchronize their, their beats. And the notion is that this is probably a good way of masking their location from acoustically oriented predators. 
So if, if the whole group is all singing in sync, the predator isn't going to be able to single out any one of them. And um, I have recordings of crickets, and an airplane will go over, and it completely breaks apart the synchrony. And uh, it takes them about half an hour to get back in sync after the airplane has completely left the sound field. And an airplane, airplane sounds travel hundreds of miles. So it's not just when it's going over. Um, the impact of the sound um, can, can last you know, 15 minutes. And so there's like 45 minutes of that creature's life during which it's more vulnerable to predators who are tuning into the, to the acoustics. Um, every time an airplane goes over, and in a lot of, certainly in southern Vermont where I live, <coughs> airplanes are always going over. We're in the, the westbound flight lane out of Logan, so um, there's hardly any time when there aren't airplanes going over. So. Um, that's something that uh, a lot of the work that's being done now, I know the national parks are doing a lot with putting autonomous recorders out uh, in remote areas and uh, measuring the impact on the local soundscape by uh, airplanes, uh, snowmobiles, ATVs, truck and car traffic on the, on the roads that go through the parks and, and all of that. And I think that's uh, that is, at the very least, raising people's appreciation for how impactful these uh, very normal, everyday sounds are on uh, natural systems. Um, so one of the big challenges of, of soundscape ecology is, is this thing. Um, this is a, a song meter for from Wildlife Acoustics. It is a semi-autonomous uh, soundscape recorder. Uh, thanks to the digital revolution, um, we now have recorders uh, that can fit in your hand. Where you know, uh, 40 years ago, you had to buy this reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that was this big and and weighed 20 pounds and was so power hungry you had to carry a truck of car <laughs> batteries with you if you wanted to take it out in the field. Um, really just in the last decade, this, this recorder, which was one of the very first uh, digital high quality digital handheld recorders, came out, in 27, uh, came out in 2007. It's only 11 years that these things have been around. These things have only been around you know, not even a decade. But now we can put these recorders, these, these things, you, they use very little battery power. Um, of course, memory cards now, you can put so much storage on a little card that you can put these out in remote areas for months at a time. And you, you can put them on a timer schedule, so whatever your protocol is, a common one, is just to record five minutes out of every hour. It's out there for months recording five minutes out of every hour. Then you go and you collect the memory card and you have hundreds and hundreds of hours of data that you have to deal with. And um, there's a lot more of this going on than what used to be. You'd, you'd, ha you'd have to put it on your, your reel-to-reel tape recording and then you'd have to listen to the whole thing. And you'd have to transcribe it. You'd have to do like a, you'd have to create one of these manually, you'd have to listen with, with a chart in front of you, and you'd have to pencil in, you know. Um, they had things, they had machines that could do some of that transcribing, but, you know, we were involved. With these, you have so much data, you, you can't just scan it. You can, you, can, you can create the spectrogram really easily on a computer, um, and you can look at that for significant information. Um, but it's just, it's, you can't listen to it all. It's just, it, it's just impossible. So as a result of that, they, we're trying to create computer algorithms that can analyze all of that audio data and automatically tell us these indices of presence or absence or uh, you know, abundance and diversity. And it's just not working out very well. Um, they're trying now to use artificial intelligence to analyze, they're calling it deep learning, which I, I find a somewhat offensive term, <laughs> or at least I feel jealous, because I think there's another kind of depth that, that artificial into these artificial intelligence programs are missing. 
And that depth is the depth that we get from listening. And there's a lot going on uh, in the sound field that we're picking up, <clears throat> that we're picking up on subconsciously, um, that gives us an understanding of what's happening in the, in the total sound field that you just can't get from a recorder. But it takes time. Um, and, and Bernie, I know this is an issue because Bernie had, had an article that, uh, that he wrote for uh, the Yale School of Forestry last year, and he said, um, <clears throat> in order to comprehend the soundscape, we need to listen to the sound produced collectively by all the organisms in a habitat as it is presented to us holistically over the broad temporal arc of its own revelation, not over the fragmented, highly compressed arc of our impatient demand for quantifiable information. Listening takes time. It also takes stillness of mind. I think that's actually part of why listening is really powerful, a way of, of relating to the natural world, because the voice in our head, that monologue in our head that's running so often, can't operate at the same time that we're listening. It can when we're looking. We can be doing a visual task, and our inner commentator is going yammer, 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 yammer. But you can't listen and yammer in your head at the same time. It's not neurologically possible. So when we listen, not only does our, that's our own sort of self-perpetuating inner script stop, but then we're also tuning into the voices of the natural world and what they're saying and what their scripts are and what they're telling us. And a lot of, a lot of people who spend a lot of time listening to the natural world um, and, and doing nature recording report this experience of it's like this shift in perspective that I'm sure most if not all of you have experienced in some way with the natural world where I kind of disappear I'm no longer me listening to that that is everything and I'm part of it and that shift comes fairly powerfully and fairly commonly through listening and I think it's because of that neurological thing that's going on. So I am uh, a strong advocate for bringing actual listening in real time, in real places, with all of the inconvenience of that, uh, back into the realm of soundscape ecology. And uh, I just wonder what difference it makes uh, for how we understand the data if we have a lifetime of experience with opening our ears and listening to the natural world.